My ex-wife Sarah, 41 female, who used to be part of my life, decided to do something really unfair and hurtful. She was secretly cheating with another guy. When things started to unravel, she tried to make me look like the bad guy. She even called the cops on me saying that I was dangerous, which was totally not true. But here's where it gets interesting. I had videos that showed she was lying, so I decided it was time to officially end our marriage through divorce court. In the end, not only did I get to keep our kids with me all the time, but she also didn't get any of our stuff or money. And let me tell you, I've never felt better about getting my peaceful life back. Now, for a little backstory for those who might not know me. I'm the dad whose wife got our kids to let a wild bunny go right in our yard. I had suggested that maybe the kids should take the bunny to the bushes, thinking it'd be safer for the bunny there. Well, guess what happened? A hawk saw the bunny and, well, nature happened right in front of our kids. They were super upset with their mom after that. After the bunny situation, our kids were really upset and started calling their mom the bunny destroyer, which kind of fits if you think about it. Once the story about her affair spread, others started calling her that too. Now, with the divorce finalized a few months back, I feel like I've finally got my freedom back. So, let me take you through the whole saga. I even showed Sarah the post I made about the whole bunny incident, and boy was she mad. That led to a big argument between us, and after that, she wouldn't talk to me for a week. Despite everything, I tried to make sure our kids didn't treat their mom badly because of the bunny thing. I even put them in time out or grounded them for a bit to teach them it wasn't okay to be mean, even if they were really upset. The nickname Bunny Destroyer became a sort of go-to thing for our kids whenever they were mad at their mom. Eventually, Sarah thought a bit and admitted she should have listened to my advice about the bunny and taken it to the bushes. She said she felt like she needed to stand her ground because she didn't want to admit she was wrong. I appreciated her saying sorry, so I said sorry too for putting the whole bunny story online. I thought it might help if we tried marriage counseling to work through our issues, but she wasn't interested. She acted like our marriage was fine and didn't need any help, so I didn't push it. Things seemed to be improving between us for a bit. Then one day my oldest kid came to me, looking like she had something important she wanted to say. When my oldest came to me with a heavy heart, it turned out there was a bigger issue than just the bunny incident that was bothering her about her mom. She was nervous about telling me, but I reassured her that she could trust me with anything. What she revealed next was a bombshell and shifted everything for me in a moment. She told me that for months while I was at work, especially on some Saturdays, her mom had been bringing a man over to our house, calling him her special friend. Not only that, but she had been bribing the kids to keep the secret from me. Hearing that really struck a chord. My daughter had taken a lot of time to muster the courage to come forward with this, and it reminded me how observant and insightful kids can be. They notice much more than adults often give them credit for, and I hate it when people overlook or dismiss the intuition and feelings of children. This revelation was a turning point, and it led me to view the situation, and Sarah's actions, in an entirely new light. Looking back, there were signs that things were off. Sarah had become noticeably snappier, not just with me but with the kids too. When I tried to talk to her, especially after sharing my post about the bunny incident, it was like opening floodgates. She didn't just respond, she'd lashed out over anything and everything. From how I looked, to my personality, to the way I do things, even throwing insults at my family. She didn't stop there. She brought up my past, like the fact that I used to smoke, even though I had quit a decade ago. And then, she started locking me out of our bedroom, making a show of her upset for the whole house to hear, by crying really loudly. It was a lot. When my eldest daughter came to me with what she knew, all these pieces started to fit together in a way they hadn't before. Sarah's behavior, this sudden change in how she treated everyone, mirrored the mood swings she had when she was pregnant with our kids. It wasn't just about being distant or angry, it was a pattern. And with what my daughter told me, it clicked. She was cheating, and her actions were not just out of stress or the blue. They were part of a deeper issue we were facing as a family. Sarah has been acting really up and down mood-wise, more than usual. I've been doing a bunch of Googling, talking to some pals, and even chatting with a counselor about it. Everyone's sort of hinting that maybe she's acting all moody, not just because her hormones are all over the place, but also because she feels guilty about something not cool she did. Like, she's been seeing someone else behind my back. I'm no brain doctor, but putting two and two together, it kind of makes sense. I really, really hoped I was wrong about all this. I mean, who wants to be right about such a bummer? But I decided to get to the bottom of it. So, I ordered some sneaky cameras without anyone at home knowing. I had them sent to my job so I could pick them up without raising any eyebrows at home. Then I waited for the perfect time to set them up, a night when Sarah was out with her friends, having fun. 
Setting up these cameras was a breeze. It was pretty much just plug and play and boom, they were connected to our home Wi-Fi. Now, from pretty much any computer I use, the one at home, my laptop, or even my work computer, I can see what's happening at the house. It's like I've got eyes everywhere now, and I did all this hoping to catch what's really been going on when I'm not around. When I first decided to put up those cameras, part of me was really worried that I might be going too far. I kept thinking, what if I'm totally off base here? If it turns out I was wrong, I figured I could just take down the cameras, and it would be like nothing ever happened. But unfortunately, my fears weren't just fears. They were real. Within just the first week, the cameras showed me exactly what I was afraid of seeing. The guy Sarah was involved with turned out to be someone she used to work with. I actually knew this guy from before because Sarah and he seemed pretty chummy whenever I saw them together at work events. A few years back, Sarah decided to leave her job to focus on being a full-time mom, especially after we had our first kid. It was something we both agreed was best at the time. She kept in touch with her old work friends, since they were really close to her. Things took a turn for the worse when I discovered more about the guy Sarah was seeing. He's quite a bit younger than both of us. About 10 years younger, actually. Sarah had actually been his mentor at her old job, helping him get ready to take over her role when she decided to leave and focus on our family. Despite her leaving the job, they kept in touch. And apparently, they got really close. I mean, closer than just friends or former co-workers should be. Sarah and I are both in our 40s, but if you saw her, you might not guess that right away. She looks incredible for her age, often getting mistaken for someone much younger, like in her 20s. It seems like she took advantage of looking so young. I was feeling pretty overwhelmed by all of this, so I talked to my sister about what was happening. I even showed her the video evidence I had collected from the hidden cameras. It turns out, she wasn't totally surprised by this revelation. She had seen Sarah once at a local bar, acting way too friendly with a man who clearly wasn't me. My sister had suspected something was off for a while, but hadn't said anything until I brought it up. My sister had seen them together, this guy and Sarah, and even though they weren't kissing or anything that obvious, there was a lot of what you might call flirty touching, you know, like on the shoulders and lower back, stuff that friends don't usually do. She wasn't completely sure what was going on, so she hadn't told me about it until now. But with everything coming to light, she wished she had mentioned her suspicions earlier. To get even more evidence, I decided to step up my game and got a GPS tracker. Once I figured out how it worked, I sneaked it into the trunk of Sarah's car. That way, I could know exactly where she was going, especially when she said she was heading out with her friends. My sister and her husband were on board to help me out. They agreed to track Sarah's car the next time she said she was going for a night out. Instead of heading to her usual spot, she drove about 20 miles further out. That was definitely not where she said she'd be. She met up with the guy she was seeing there. From a safe distance, my sister and brother-in-law watched them for a while, keeping an eye on what was happening without being noticed. It was a big step in figuring out the whole truth about what was going on. Seeing the footage my sister and brother-in-law captured, where the other guy kept rubbing Sarah's belly as they talked, hit me hard. It was like a punch to the gut, making everything else click into place. Her moodiness at home, her secretive behavior, it all made a painful kind of sense now. She was probably pregnant. The realization shattered me, turning my world upside down in the worst way possible. My initial reaction was to numb the pain with alcohol, to just drown out the reality of the situation. But my sister stepped in, her voice of reason cutting through my despair. She insisted that drinking would only make things worse, not better. She was right, of course. Instead of spiraling further, I decided to take some time off work to get my head straight. But I told Sarah a different story, that I was going on a business trip. Her reaction to my supposed business trip was shocking. She seemed almost thrilled at the idea of me being away, barely hiding her happiness about it. It felt like I didn't even know who she was anymore. This wasn't the woman I married nearly two decades ago. It was as if one day, someone who just looked like her took her place. How could she be so different, so distant from the person I thought I knew? The more I thought about it, the more alienated I felt. Trying to make sense of her actions, her feelings, seemed pointless. Nothing added up anymore, and it felt like understanding her, or the situation, was beyond my grasp. It was a moment of profound confusion and heartbreak, leaving me questioning everything I thought was real about our life together. With the house now under full surveillance and my sister and brother-in-law kindly offering to have my kids stay with them for a bit, a visit the kids were excited about, it left Sarah with the freedom she apparently was looking for. Not long after I was out of the house, she wasted no time in calling her affair partner over. He was there by the evening, ready to spend the night. I'm not going to delve into the specifics of what happened in the house while he was there. It's enough to say that their actions were a clear betrayal of our marriage. 
But what cut even deeper were the conversations they had, mocking me, discussing the baby they were expecting, and strategizing about the future once it became apparent she was pregnant. They knew they had to come up with a plan before her pregnancy became visible, especially since she was already three months along. The complexity of the situation was underscored by the fact that the affair partner is of a different race than I am, making it obvious from the start that the baby couldn't possibly be mine. Sarah seemed unconcerned, brushing off his worries by saying they had plenty of time to figure things out. To add insult to injury, she nonchalantly revealed that this wasn't her first time stepping out on our marriage. She mentioned another affair from when she was 29. This whole situation felt like a surreal nightmare, far removed from the life and the person I thought I knew. The woman I married seemed like a stranger to me now, her actions and words on those tapes a stark, painful contrast to the memories and promises we once shared. Hearing Sarah express her disdain for our life together and describe me as a boring man she was only with for financial security was like a knife to the heart. She was candid about her fatigue with playing the role of a devoted wife and her eagerness to leave that life behind. What hit even harder was her indifference towards our children. When her affair partner questioned her about them, she coldly suggested that I could just take them, as if our kids were mere afterthoughts in her plan for a new start with her do-over baby. The idea that she preferred the notion of starting anew over the family we built together, citing a preference our kids might have for me as a reason for her detachment, was both shocking and heartbreaking. It was almost too much to bear, sitting alone in that motel room, feeling a world away from everything I thought was true and secure in my life. The urge to destroy the laptop in front of me, the messenger of all this betrayal, was strong, but I managed to hold back, choosing instead to try and distract myself with dinner and a movie, anything to escape the crushing reality for a moment. But distraction provided little solace, and much of the night was spent in a haze of disbelief and hurt, the hours dragging until sleep mercifully took over. The woman I had loved, committed to, and envisioned growing old with had become a stranger, revealing a capacity for cruelty I couldn't have imagined. It was a harsh lesson in the realities of people's potential for betrayal, a reminder that sometimes, the person you think you know best can turn out to be someone entirely different. The revelation of Sarah's true nature was a turning point for me. It was in that moment of clarity, amid the turmoil, that I decided I would no longer be the passive player in our marriage's downfall. My usual calm and collected demeanor was replaced with a determination fueled by betrayal. I resolved to not just walk away from this marriage, but to do so in a way that protected my interests and those of our children. The decision to seek a divorce wasn't just a response to her infidelity. It was a stand against the disregard and disrespect she had shown our family. The following day, I took a decisive step towards ending our marriage legally. I sought out a law firm known for its prowess in divorce cases, asking specifically for the most formidable lawyer they had. Given that we live in a state where the law considers the circumstances of a divorce an at-fault state, the evidence I had of her affair put me in a strong position. The lawyer's initial hesitation vanished once I shared the details of my case and showed him the video evidence. His reaction, a mix of professional anticipation and a sense of justice about to be served, reassured me that I had made the right choice. We agreed to proceed with the divorce process, both of us aware that the case was not just about dissolving a marriage, but about addressing the wrongdoing that led us here. The day I had Sarah served with divorce papers, I ensured that the impact on our children would be minimal, timing it for when I was working from home and they were at school. The delivery of the papers by the sheriff directly into Sarah's hands was a symbolic moment, marking the beginning of the end of our shared life and the start of my journey towards healing and finding peace. Capturing the moment Sarah was served with the divorce papers on camera added another layer to this surreal chapter of our lives. Her reaction upon reading the papers was a mix of fear and fury. She stormed into my office, ready to unleash her anger, but I was a wall of calm. By this point, I had emotionally detached from our marriage and her antics. She tried to initiate a fight, but I stood firm, my decision made. I demanded she leave the house, reminding her that I was the one who had always paid the mortgage. Her response was to scream that I couldn't do this to her and to throw a desperate threat my way, claiming she'd fabricate stories of abuse and try to get me fired if I pushed forward with the divorce. I challenged her to proceed with her threats, pointing out the futility of her actions given her current situation and her involvement with another man, which was already a betrayal of our marriage. The mention of her affair and the pregnancy left her shocked, revealing the extent of my knowledge. Her wide-eyed silence asked the questions her voice couldn't. I simply told her I knew enough. Despite her refusal to leave, claiming equal rights to the house, 
It was clear that our shared path had come to an end. The lines were drawn, and what started as a partnership had dissolved into a battleground of wills, with the truth as my strongest ally. Her retreat to the bedroom and subsequent call to the police were tactics right out of a playbook I was becoming all too familiar with. Watching her feign panic, complete with a deceptive smile, was both chilling and enlightening. It confirmed the length she was willing to go to manipulate the situation to her advantage. Her acting skills were remarkable, a fact that would have been convincing to anyone unaware of the truth behind her facade. As the police arrived, I made sure to welcome them openly, indicating there was nothing to hide. Their initial demeanor suggested they were prepared for a serious confrontation, likely expecting a chaotic scene. However, the calm and orderly state of the house quickly dispelled that notion. Sarah's dramatic entrance, appealing directly to the officers with claims of my supposed mania, was her playing the victim, a role she seemed to embrace wholeheartedly. I knew that the truth needed to come to light. With calm clarity, I requested one of the officers to review evidence that contradicted Sarah's narrative. The moment I mentioned having recorded evidence, the shock and realization on Sarah's face spoke volumes. She hadn't anticipated this turn of events. Showing the officer the video from my laptop, where she openly admitted to concocting allegations against me, was a pivotal moment. It was a clear demonstration that the situation she portrayed was a calculated fabrication, aiming to manipulate perceptions and outcomes to her favor. This evidence shifted the narrative, exposing the manipulations and lies she was willing to employ to achieve her ends. Then I showed the footage from the living room after she ran out of my office and into the master bedroom down the hall. And then I showed the footage from the camera in the bedroom of her calling the police and just straight up lying. I had recorded it all and from multiple angles at that. And even though she claimed to the police that I had supposedly hit her, there was not only no marks on her, but the cameras all around the house showed a completely different story. Then I handed the police a thumb drive and said it had all the video footage they needed of her calling them under false pretenses. Sarah, even in the face of all of this evidence, stuck to her lie, saying that I was a horrible person and even tried to say the recordings were illegal and therefore inadmissible. But I pointed out that they are legal because they were security cameras inside of my own home and not recorded in public. Sarah looked at the police officer and told them to please do something, to which they absolutely did because she was the one put in handcuffs and she started bawling like a child. I could only sit there shaking my head. This was once the woman I'd loved so much for so many years. I thought she was a wonderful, intelligent, and endearing person, but I couldn't have been more wrong, as the police took her away. She screamed that they couldn't do this to her, but didn't fight back much. Otherwise, resisting arrest would have been added to her charges. I then shut down all of her credit cards that were in my name and stopped any future payments into the joint bank account so she had to use entirely her own money to bail herself out of jail. She had saved plenty of money all those years that she was still working while the mortgage was only on me, so she was literally anything but broke. She came back for her car, which I had taken the liberty of, packing a few of her suitcases full of her clothes, as well as some other things, and left the key on the seat, so she wasn't even able to come back into the house. Sarah's parents did come to speak to me a day after she bailed herself out of jail. Initially, they only had the backstories of what she told them, which was basically the same things she tried to tell the police. Her father especially was ready to attack me. He is old, but he's also very big and very strong. But when I asked him if he knew anything about Sarah's affair or her pregnancy, he looked very surprised, and thankfully gave me the chance to explain myself. So I pulled out the laptop again, and I showed my in-laws what I had recorded. And when they found out the truth, they were disgusted and said that they couldn't believe this person was their daughter. They apologized to me and said that they would keep in touch to help out with my kids. Then they called Sarah on speakerphone right in front of me and confronted her about all of her lies. She tried to double down until they said that they were with me and that they had seen the recordings. They said that they knew everything and they wanted her out of her house immediately. She tried to backpedal, but my in-laws said that they did not raise their daughter to act this way and they were astonished that she would try to frame her own husband and she was no longer their daughter. They disowned her over the phone right then and there, and then hung up before Sarah could say anything else. She tried calling back, but they ignored her every attempt. And when they got home, not only was she gone, but she had destroyed several things around the house, which my mother-in-law was in tears about. Now, I still consider my ex his parents, my in-laws, because they still would drop in from time to time just to see their grandchildren. But my ex, on the other hand, is effectively non-existent to us. Sarah later came back with her affair partner in tow to pack her things. 
The affair partner wouldn't even come into the house and Sarah refused to speak a word to me, all while gathering her remaining belongings. She knew there were cameras everywhere, and she would only dig herself a bigger grave if she tried anything else. I wasn't alone either, as my sister and brother-in-law were there to keep an eye on her. My brother-in-law made sure to keep his eye on the affair partner from the window. Sarah was still packing when the kids got home, and she made no attempt to speak to them either, not even when our youngest was crying for her before leaving. She did take a few of the photos that we had of each other from our wedding off the wall and threw them on the floor just to break them. I think she was expecting a reaction out of me because of the way she looked at me while doing it. But since I didn't say anything, she just took the last of her bags and walked out the door. After she was gone, I had to call my elderly mother to come stay with me for a while because I couldn't take care of the kids alone. I couldn't take a lot of time off of work, and I didn't have a lot of daycare options either. And you know what? I also ordered DNA tests for my kids because even though I was sure that they were mine, several people told me that just in case I had to know. And thankfully, yes, both of my children are mine. About a week later, Sarah showed up at my door saying that she would agree to a clean divorce if I did as well, meaning that she would have gotten half of everything if I had agreed. But I straight up said no to her face. There was some fighting back and forth, and she more or less admitted to finding out that the law in this state was definitely not on her side. After all, we met, we got engaged, and got married and lived our whole lives in this state. There was no way she could get out of taking a major loss unless I agreed to settle, which I absolutely did not. Then I said that she betrayed me, our kids, her parents, and practically everyone by having this affair. I then slammed the door in her face. She quietly left, and I didn't see her again until court a few months later in divorce court. Sarah was visibly quite pregnant by then, and she had gotten a lawyer as well. The affair partner was nowhere to be seen. I expected her to try and lie to the judge, which she started to do a few times, but I had enough video evidence to refute any of her lies. So she really didn't have any kind of chance to win this. So instead, she just kind of dragged out the divorce by simply refusing to cooperate and making various demands. She wanted most of my savings, for starters, and she wanted a long list of other things that I own, and she wanted me to buy out of her half of the house, even though she never paid into it. On my end, I was pushing for full custody of the kids and to get her name off of the deed of my house. After all, I had the video evidence to back up how she said that she didn't even care about our children anymore and how she would make up all these lies just to hurt my reputation. Sarah tried to stall and repeatedly would change her demands, but the judge didn't let her keep dragging things out. This being an at-fault state meant that she was entitled to very little since she was the one who committed the affair, and her attempting to frame me only made her case even worse. In the end, she lost all custody of our kids and walked away with nothing more than her belongings, and that honestly could be considered a fair financial settlement, considering the circumstances, as well as the car I had previously bought for her. The title was in my name, but I signed it over without any care in the world as part of the settlement. She made no attempts to even speak to our kids during the entire divorce anyways, so I ended up getting full custody. The house is entirely mine now, and I'm completely free of this crazy woman. My now ex-wife did try to keep up with her lies about me to others before and during the divorce, but my sister spread word around of Sarah's infidelity, and soon all mutual friends cut her off when they realized who was telling the truth. She and her affair partner left town together after the divorce ended. I heard that the affair partner wasn't fired, but he was transferred where he got transferred to. Who knows? But I do know that my ex had to go with him. They could have transferred him and my ex to freezing Greenland for all I care. I'm just happy that they've both left. My ex should have had a do-over baby by now, and I hope it was all worth it to her. Now, this is not what I expected to be posting online after just talking about Sarah releasing a bunny where a hawk could get it. But many of the comments I previously got about the way that Sarah was acting made me realize that I should have been paying attention to the red flags a long time ago. I guess I just kept rose-tinted glasses on for the entirety of our marriage. But it's all over now, and I'm so thankful that I have my life to live. That I